Bears down deep. It's in it for Reiser. It's in it. It is my honor to announce the winner of the 1993 John W. Heisman Memorial Trophy, Charlie Ward of Florida State University. In 1946, Florida State University had no stadium, had no uniforms or helmets, had no coach, and didn't have a football team. Then in 1947, a mere six weeks after the decision to play college football was announced, the Florida State football program was born amidst the dimly lit lights of what used to be Centennial Field. Virtually overnight, a dream became reality with the first game versus Stetson. From those humble beginnings, Florida State has grown into a major college football powerhouse achieving several milestones along the way. The Seminoles became the first team in the state of Florida to go to a bowl in 1950 and to play in an out-of-state bowl game, traveling to El Paso for the 1955 Sun Bowl. In 1993, the Seminoles became the only football program started after World War II to win a national championship. Currently, the Seminoles have finished in the Associated Press Top Four a record nine straight years and have one of the finest bowl records in the land. Year in and year out, the Seminoles are contenders for the national crown. There's no doubt that the first 50 years of Seminole football have been garnet and golden. Tradition. When it comes to college football, the word conjures up images of Newt Rockney, Bear Bryant, no helmet football, and the Army-Navy game. Schools celebrating their 100th year of football boast of a grand tradition. But Florida State, which will begin its 50th year of college football in the fall of 1996, has proven that it doesn't take 100 years to build tradition. All it takes is success. Classic games like Bill Peterson's 1967 squad's 37-37 tie against Bear Bryant and defending national champion Alabama. Or the Seminoles' miraculous 28-point fourth quarter comeback against the Florida Gators in 1994. Legendary coaches like Tom Nugent, who popularized the I formation, or Bobby Bowden, who is one of just two active head coaches with over 250 career victories. Award winners like Florida State's first Little All-American, Hugh Adams, its first consensus All-American, Fred Belichnikov, or the school's first Heisman Trophy winner, Charlie Ward. Storied seasons from the first undefeated season of 1950 to the unbeaten 1979 campaign to the national title season of 1993. Many might think a school so young would lack its own legendary figures, but this is far from the truth. In only 50 short years, FSU has amassed their own great traditions. Who will ever forget the shaved heads and ferocious defensive play of the Seven Magnificents or the impressive upsets sprung by the King of the Road, Bobby Bowden? Or the colorful nicknames associated with all American play at FSU, like Jingle Joints, Ron Sellers, or Prime Time, Deion Sanders? And while college football is full of symbols, the entire nation knows that Chief Osceola rides tall and wins every race. College football is a consuming passion that binds like no other. 
It's that passion that ties the five decades of Seminole football to their foundation. Florida State University's tradition might be short on years, but in terms of achievement, All-Americans, bowl success, national award winners, and simply in heart, grit, determination, and pride, Seminole football boasts a tradition few schools can match. In 1947, amongst the red bricks and Spanish moss of Tallahassee, a university was beginning to take on a new personality. No longer Florida Intercollegiate College for Women, Florida State University had become co-educational, and with this change, the school quickly embarked on intercollegiate athletics. Actually, intercollegiate football was not a complete stranger to Tallahassee. Florida State College played three years of early century football beginning in 1902. In fact, in 1904, the school even won a title, being crowned Florida's state champions. However, fundamental changes in the higher education system led to the canceling of intercollegiate sports, while the school went on to become one of the nation's finest women's colleges. So, for all intents and purposes, Florida State football, as we know it, was born under the muted lights of Centennial Field on October 18, 1947, against Stetson University. The team was led onto the field that night by head coach Ed Williamson, who served as the school's unpaid intramural director. The football program offered no scholarships, had no team name, no real stadium, and set out to compete with just over a month to prepare for its first ever game. We didn't have any locker rooms. The boys had to dress in the old, in the barracks. That was on the West Campus. And um, they uh, dressed there. They washed their own uniforms of the wives, washed them if they had a wife. And uh, it just wasn't anything like they have today. Our pants were made out of that hard canvas. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, it was real, and uh, the pads kind of slipped in there and they were, they were not plastic or, or what do you want to call fiberglass kind of pads today. These things we talk about, they were hard, stiff pads, shoulder pads that had very little flex to them. The helmets were made, we, we played probably, the first year we played was the last year of the leather helmets. The Garnet and Gold, as they were known on that night, launched a valiant attack to take an early lead before succumbing 14 to 6. Charles McMillan of Quincy, Florida, hauled in the school's first touchdown catch. Well, everybody was waiting with great anticipation. Most of us were on that first squad, were just pickup group of young men that wanted to play football. Centennial Field was real crowded that night. The stands were filled. A lot of people were there, a lot of excitement because it was the first intercollegiate game in Tallahassee. Known as the Garnet and Gold for the first game, it was realized that Florida State's new team needed an identity. Students suggested names, and soon a list of suggestions had been narrowed to six finalists. Campus gossip had it that the Crackers would win in a cakewalk. Seminoles were the favorite of many, but far from an overwhelming choice. One-fourth of the student body eventually voted on the name, with many doctoring ballots to assure that Seminoles would win. In the end, Seminoles won by a mere 110 votes over statesmen. In 1948, the coaching whistle was turned over to the capable hands of Don Veller. A former Indiana University and Big Ten All-Star, Veller knew big-time college football and turned his FSU tenure into a time of many firsts for the young program. Doleful Don, as he later would be dubbed, did it with mirrors. He had no scholarship players. A sand-strewn practice field at abandoned Dale Mabry Air Force Base and a stadium without locker rooms. It was, it was dusty as heck. Well, it was, we had to sprinkle it almost everywhere almost hand, hand sprinkle most of the time before we could practice because it was so dusty. And uh, we had redone an old bandstand. 
and it was the, our, our, our locker room and coach's room and everything. Veller Seminoles won a remarkable 30 of his first 34 contests. On October 9, 1948, the curtain was raised on Veller's first season in a game versus Cumberland. Later that night, the city of Tallahassee and the school's fans had a victory to bask in. Led by Ken McLean, who carried the ball 16 times for an impressive 146 yards, FSU prevailed for a 30 to nothing victory. That night, the Seminoles ran Beller's cockeyed T offense to perfection. It was an unbalanced line, and then we could play some single wing, and uh, the quarterback was up underneath the, the uh, center like he is now, but we could, he could shift out of that, move out of that. Uh, one man can be in motion backwards. In 1948, the Seminoles would join the Dixie Conference, where they dominated play for the next three seasons, winning three straight league titles. The year also produced FSU's first small school Little All-American, tackle Hugh Adams. 1948 also marked the arrival of one of the most famous icons of Seminole football and a first-time cheer. Many FSU fans hear the nickname Old Ironsides and assume it refers to a rough and ready player or a stout defensive line. But in Florida state lore, the name refers to the 1942 Beck Motor Coach bus that became the Seminoles' transportation to road games until 1961. We got it in 1948, so it was used all the, during the war years, pretty hot and heavy. Had a lot of miles on it, and the engine was uh, not in the best shape in the world. It must have had about 300,000 miles when they bought it. They thought they'd buy something real great, but it would, it would break down every time we would get out, almost every time we'd have to go out and push it. From day one of Florida State football, the Seminoles were underdogs, and like most underdogs, the newly formed tribe were a group of overachievers with uncommon spirit. Personifying that spirit was a man who never played the game. At five foot four, Doug Bonifay stood about as tall as FSU football did at the time. However, in 1947, he played as big a part as anyone in the beginning of Seminole tradition. I jumped up on the table and said, uh, FSU one time. And uh, everybody yelled. So I said, FSU two times, and everybody yelled, and FSU three times, and everybody yelled. So then I said, well, FSU all the damn time, and then they went crazy. Anytime a game was going slowly, Bonifay would be hoisted atop the crowd and passed up and down the stands, riling up the FSU fans with FSU time. all the damn time. FSU two times. FSU three times, FSU all the damn time. Nineteen forty nine will best be remembered for three things. In a contest against Whiting Field, FSU produced one of the most productive quarters in school history. The tribe's offense exploded for five touchdowns in the second period, en route to a blowout, 74 to nothing victory. The coach at uh, Great Lakes Naval uh, Training Station, which was one, had another football powerhouse, the guy called me right after and said, uh, can you give me a report on Whiting Field? And I said, no, I said, I can't, I, I can't tell you. I said, they're so bad that, uh, that you, you don't need any scouting notes. Anyhow, that following weekend, they played them in Wagon Field Beat Great Lakes, and I, I was so embarrassed. The Seminoles' 11-game winning streak came to an end versus a Livingston State squad coached by Bon Mancha, who would later move to Florida State as an assistant head coach and athletic director. In a game promoted locally by the city of Selma, Alabama, Signals got crossed on who was to hire the game's officials. We were discussing with the promotion people in Selma. I said, 
we used high school officials back in those days, both of us. And I told him, I said, get, he wanted to use the local group because it was free. It was all charity. It was a fundraising thing. And I said, no, don't get the local officials. That looks kind of funny. We got ready to kick off, and there were no officials. And he came over and told me, since we, I'm sorry, there's no officials. We have to get them out of the stands. Held Veller up for a few minutes and told him that the officials, I hope they didn't have a wreck or something, that we might have to hold the game up. I hope that, you know. They finally got some officials, some people out of the stands. And uh, <laughs> they weren't crooked. They just didn't call anything. Veller never accepted it. He felt like we'd framed him on the official. Well, then he hired me later on, as you know. And, and um, of course, I told him one day that, well, unfortunately about that, it was about four of those officials played with me in Alabama. <laughs> A successful 8-1 and one season earned the Seminoles their first bowl invitation. The Cigar Bowl would match Florida State against Wofford, winners of 23 straight contests. The bid was an honor for FSU, which had eluded other state schools with longer football histories. The Seminoles upended Wofford 19 to 6, but the game was not a total success. FSU players were promised watches for their efforts, but instead, each received a rubber football stamped with a Cigar Bowl logo. To make matters worse, several players spotted those same footballs in local Tampa stores, selling for 39 cents. By the time the 1950 season rolled around, FSU was beginning to outgrow previous opponents. If Florida State was to play big-time college football, it would need a big-time college football stadium. Tallahassee businessman Rainey Cawthon and members of the Tallahassee Athletic Council sold 1,000 five-year season ticket packages to help finance a stadium. On October 28, 1950, Doak S. Campbell Stadium was dedicated in honor of the university president who fought as hard as anyone to establish the program. A new stadium wasn't the only highlight of that homecoming night. FSU also got itself a fight song. In a contest to name the school band, FSU student Pat Gunno's entry of Marching Chiefs was proclaimed the winner, and the Chiefs were introduced that evening for the first time. They introduced a song that will always spark emotions in the hearts of Seminole fans. The Seminole fight song featured words by class of 1950 alumnus Doug Alley and an arrangement by professor of music Tommy Wright. With the ingredients for tradition being added to the mix, the 1950 team went undefeated, a first for Florida State. The famed Ice Bowl versus Tampa, with game time temperatures in Tallahassee as low as 12 degrees, would conclude the unblemished run. I think I've heard that 10,000 people tell me there was that game and they couldn't have been because there was, the stands were completely empty, people got in their cars. The contest was tied at 13 entering the fourth quarter before FSU erupted for the 35-19 win. With the win, FSU claimed yet another Dixie Conference Championship. The 1950 season also gave Seminole Faithful a look at a young Howard quarterback that would later return to FSU to make quite a name for himself, Bobby Bowden. 1951 and 52 were transition years into big-time college football. FSU withdrew from the undefeated comfort of the Dixie Conference and added teams like the Miami Hurricanes. Miami became the first national opponent to play the Tribe, establishing an excitement-filled rivalry that remains FSU's oldest to this day. Veller brought the Tribe to the brink of major college football status, but retired while on top following the 1952 season. Much credit for FSU's football growth goes to Veller, whose sound and spectacular coaching helped the Seminoles earn a reputation, young, hungry, and eager to compete quickly. Nineteen fifty-three was a year of change for FSU. 
And the man who would lead the tribe into the world of major college football was Tom Nugent. Incredible coach in terms of being innovative. We, we were the first team. He invented the iPhone Mason. He invented the typewriter huddle. He invented the, well, the, we call it the lonesome man, but it was wide out. And uh, we also practiced the huddle more than we practiced football. We had a great huddle. I used to love to go to practice. And the reason I used to love to go to practice because I couldn't wait to find out what we were going to do new or different under Tom Nugent. Uh, Tom was such an innovator and so enthusiastic about everything he was uh, doing and the direction he was taking, uh, you know, the university. 1953 would be the last year of FSU's small school status. The year would bring a recruit to Tallahassee who was possibly the most valuable of Nugent's tenure. Lee Corso, a Miami native who excelled at quarterback, defensive back, and running back. I, I decided basically, though, to go to Florida State because uh, I thought that I wanted to be able to build something. I wanted to be able to be a part of a starting of a tradition. So I felt that if I could go there, maybe I could help start a football tradition at a great school. The season began with an early victory versus the Johnny Unitas-led Louisville Cardinals, 59 to nothing. 53 would also bring Nugent's most memorable win in a game versus his former school, Virginia Military Institute, and the nation's leading rusher at the time, Johnny Mapp. So I told the players, and I put it really to them because I was telling the God's truth, I said, I will never, I promise you, I will never ask my final team, wherever it happens to be, I will never ask them to win a game for me. I'll sacrifice it to ask you to win this game for me. This is my one game. And I told them how I felt. And they rallied around. Boy, I, I saw a, a lot of tears. It was a great, wonderful feeling. The Tampa matchup concluded the season. Bobby Fiveash, who was the first Seminole saluted as the state's top college football player, gained 141 yards in FSU's 41-6 victory. 1954 brought FSU's first winning season against major college opponents. New faces included Ron Schomberger, Vic Prinzi, Gene Cox, and a highly touted running back, Burt Reynolds. Yes, Smokey and the Bandit, whose most famous run would be a 54-yard gallop versus Auburn. It gets better every year. In the last uh, 37 years, it's, it's got up to 125 yards. Now. I, I, I start in the parking lot, go all across the, the Jordan Hare Stadium. And, you know, as years go by, you get better and better because uh, when we all get together, we lie more and more. In 1954, Don Falls left his job in the St. Louis Cardinals organization to become head trainer of a young athletic program at Florida State University. When he made his move to Tallahassee, Falls figured the job would be a stepping stone to his great ambition of becoming a head trainer for a major league baseball team. However, Falls found that the city of Tallahassee provided the perfect environment in which to raise his three children. And after 27 years of service and over 300 Seminole football games, Falls retired from FSU in 1986. Falls' stature Five foot seven and all of 145 pounds, along with his booming voice, earned him the nickname Rooster among players and co-workers. To some, he also became known as Doc, or Pop, or even Old Man. No matter what you called him, though, Falls was much more than just a trainer. I don't know if there's any one man that has the respect and love of all of the former athletes at Florida State any more than Don because he treated and took care of all of them. He was always there. We could always talk to Don Falls. He was one of the most inspirational men that's ever been at Florida State University, ever. He was such a very, very important person in my life, and I'm sure every athlete that he came in contact with. He was the glue here at Florida State. And he is a person who I call an icon at Florida State. 
and God, I miss him. As the most recognizable link from Seminole football past to Seminole football present, Falls is remembered as one of the most popular men ever connected with Florida State Athletics. Following the 1954 season, FSU was invited to the Sun Bowl in El Paso, Texas, becoming the first Florida school ever to play in an out-of-state bowl game. The tribe's players had such a good time that by the time the game kicked off, it was as if they had forgotten how to play. A team that led the nation with 19 touchdown passes wound up on the losing end to Texas Western. Despite the loss, one thing was becoming apparent. FSU had begun to carve its niche against Southern powers. FSU Athletic Director Howard Danford and Bob Woodruff of Florida scheduled a meeting to begin talks on starting an FSU-UF football series. With much resistance, UF finally agreed to a series with FSU with several favorable conditions. The 55 season was also significant as the last for one of the most spirited players in Florida State history. An enthusiastic and inspirational leader, Bob Crenshaw played center and co-captain the 1955 Seminole football team. Crenshaw was known as a rough and tumble individual who would do anything for his team. And his never say die attitude persisted right down to his final game. With the tribe belting Tampa, Crenshaw asked to go back in for one last play. He raced into the contest just long enough to get his teeth knocked out. What an exceptional great athlete, but a hard, dedicated worker. He'd come out early every day work. He stayed late snapping the ball. Three years later, while serving his country, the Air Force jet that Crenshaw was piloting crashed. In honor of his courage and commitment, FSU established the Bob Crenshaw Award, given each year to the Seminole with the biggest heart. In the preseason of 1958, Nugent proclaimed the returning squad to be his most talented ever. They would not disappoint, with impressive wins over Tennessee Tech, Furman, Wake Forest, and Virginia Tech. Then, on the night of October 25th, the tribe would record one of its biggest victories ever. Ironically, the Seminoles played the University of Tennessee only after the Volunteers scratched the University of Maryland from their schedule. Before the matchup, a Knoxville journalist billed the Seminoles as a second-rate gridiron power. Although many Seminoles took this personally, it was hard to argue the fact, as FSU was 0-10 against Southeastern Conference schools up until that time. Although scoreless in the first half, FSU found a way to get things done after intermission. Tennessee native Fred Pickard would gallop 133 yards on 22 carries and set up Florida State's first field goal. In fact, Pickard's total was 22 yards more than the entire volunteer offense would gain. An Al Ulmer interception and a Bobby Wren reception made Tennessee pay in the 10 to nothing Florida State victory. I think in 58 that win was the difference between Florida State going from what you consider maybe small time to big time. We weren't going to let this one get by. And I'll be honest with you, after the uh, second quarter, they never crossed our 50-yard line. 3,000 fans greeted the Seminoles back in Tallahassee. We came into the airport, and when, we, when the plane went to circle the field, the guy said there's no room to land the plane. They had between five and 6,000 people on the ramp waiting for the team. Winless versus the University of Miami, FSU would down the Hurricanes for the first time in 58. FSU struck first on a 42-yard interception return for a touchdown by Joe Majors. On a day in which every bounce seemed to fall the Seminoles' way, a Vic Prinzi pass ricocheted off FSU's Tony Romeo and into the waiting hands of Fred Pickard for a touchdown. 
The tribe won 17 to 6. Four straight victories catapulted the Seminoles into their first ever clash with the University of Florida. This rivalry was spirited from the very beginning. As FSU's Jack Espenship received the opening kickoff, he quickly handed the ball off to Bobby Wren. As Wren broke free from blockers, the Gator partisan writers in the press box all stood with a collective cry of, Stop him! Stop him! Wren would be tackled at the UF 15-yard line after a 78-yard return. Five plays later, FSU had the first lead of the series, 7 to nothing. However, Florida would go on to win 21 to 7 after FSU starting quarterback Vic Prinzi tore a thigh muscle. While Don Beller sparked Florida State's football success, it was Nugent who kept the fire burning. He brought an air of confidence to a young school trying to set the college football world alight. Florida State was, was key back in those days because Nugent and Beller and all those guys did it the right way. They never cheated, they did it the honest way. We won some games, but we never prostituted our integrity to win any games. FSU's continued rise would hit a plateau in 1959 as Perry Moss became the Seminoles' fourth head coach. Already an assistant at five previous schools, Moss arrived in Tallahassee amidst high hopes and great expectations. But following a four and six campaign and a huge contract offer from the Montreal Alouettes of the Canadian Football League, he left Florida State after only one season. His departure prompted FSU to hire a separate athletic director, Vaughn Mancha. The new head coach, Bill Peterson, would come from LSU. In 1960, Bill Peterson brought a flashy passing game to Tallahassee and an 11-year reign of success. Just three games into his first season, speculation among state writers was that Florida State would never be able to keep Peterson for any length of time. How wrong they were. In fact, by the end of his term, the whole nation would hear of FSU. In his final five years, FSU threw the ball more consistently and effectively than any other team in the nation. Coach Peterson was fantastic if you're a wide receiver. If you were running back, he wasn't the best to play for. <laughs> and since I was a wide receiver, he was great because we, uh, we had uh, an exciting game plan in almost every game. Uh, we were going to move the football around. Peterson's style and philosophy helped prepare his assistants for future success at many levels. Among the coaches in Peterson's pipeline were Don James, Gene McDowell, Dan Henning, Joe Gibbs, Bill Parcells, and Bobby Bowden. But coach Bill Peterson would bring to Florida State something besides a fancy passing game, Petersonisms. Coach Pete had a wonderful way of putting the English language in a verbal blender and then turning out phrases at full speed ahead. Eddie Feely uh, used to give the little prayer before, before we went out on the field, before a game. And, uh, you know, Coach Pete said one time, he said, you know, Eddie, I'll take over the prayer. So he goes, as I lay me down to sleep, and he goes, Feely, Feely, take over, take over, you know. Well, we're going in a, in a, in a, four, in a four plane engine and that type of deal on our trips. But that was just Pete, you know, that was just Bill. And, he, you know, his mind was always ahead, you know, all, always a step ahead of himself, you know. So uh, little things that he always did, you know, we just kind of laughed and just let go. But one thing was obvious following the 60 season. The rapid turnover of the previous two years had left FSU with a lack of solid players. Recruiting intensified, and some great names would soon grace the campus. Fred Bolitnikoff played split end at Florida State from 1961 to 64 under head coach Bill Peterson. He simply defined the role of receiver before it was ever called receiver. Bolitnikoff became FSU's first consensus All-American, 
and as a senior ranked fourth in the nation with 57 receptions for 11 touchdowns, plus an amazing four more scores in the Seminoles' 36-19 Gator Bowl victory over Oklahoma. I love football. I love being a receiver. You know, I love being involved in a passing game. I, I you know, at the time, you don't realize uh, with the coaching staff how much they push you and push you and push you, you know, to get the best out of you. Bolitnikov's career was capped with induction to both the college and pro football halls of fame. Combining great hands with football savvy and tireless work habits, Bolitnikov became Florida State's first great professional star. In only their fourth attempt against the University of Florida, the Seminoles would grab the biggest moral victory in school history. In a game that Gator head coach Ray Greaves would liken to a death in the family, FSU battled to a 3-3 tie. The two touchdown favorite Gators were held in check by an impressive Florida State defensive effort. Roy Bickford, the game's MVP, would grab two interceptions and block a punt to set up FSU's lone score. Action after the game was just as intense. FSU fans charged the field and attempted to tear down the goalposts. UF fans, trying to protect their home field, guarded them as a wild 30-minute melee erupted. Clearly, the Gators' dominance was on shaky ground. The 1962 season offered a prime example of how tough it was early on for the Seminoles to schedule opponents on a fair basis. With only four games slated for the friendly confines of Doe Campbell Stadium, this squad would have to be a gritty bunch just to survive. And gritty they were. The Georgia Bulldogs, with their top ten ranked offense and defense, and a vengeful attitude, sought to spoil FSU's hot start in Athens amid increased speculation that Florida State wished to join the Southeastern Conference. FSU would tally five interceptions on this day and begin to take its place among the big-time programs of the South. The Big Road victory also started another Seminole tradition. In 1962, Seminole football captains returned home with a piece of sod from Sanford Stadium as a trophy from Florida State's 18 to nothing victory over the University of Georgia. It was presented to Dean Coyle E. Moore, who then founded the tradition of the Sod Cemetery. The treasured turf was buried in the corner of FSU's practice field, and a monument was placed to commemorate the road victory. Sod games represent difficult battles, away from home, against the crowd, against all odds. In the most trying of circumstances, some of the most courageous victories have been achieved. The highlight of the 1963 season was an early humbling of a highly touted Miami team, led by George Myra, 24 to nothing. The seeds of change were planted during 1963. However, those fruits would not totally ripen until 1964. The key to success would be a combination Seminole faithful would revere for years to come. Steve Tensey and Fred Bolitnikov. They comprised a feared passing attack that attracted the national spotlight to Tallahassee for the first time. Well, back in those days, the pros and the colleges were four lot yards in a cloud of dust. So we started building a, a passing game. And uh, finally, when we got the right personnel, intensity and, and blood and profit was like steel. Really. Their passing perfection remains the standard many Seminole fans measure by. But looking back on that bright 64 season, it was a group of rugged defenders who got FSU off on the right foot. While the Florida State offense slowly developed in 1964, one of the most famed defensive units in school history took center stage.
Their symbol, the shaved head, was a takeoff from the movie The Magnificent Seven, in emulation of star Yul Brynner. The unit, coached primarily by Bob Harbison, consisted of the front seven, George DeLisandro, Avery Sumner, Jack Schinholzer, Frank Penny, Max Wettstein, Bill McDowell, and Dick Herman. One of them sneaked up behind me with a razor, and all I saw was all my hair falling over into my lap. And I said, go ahead, let's do it. They wanted to make a commitment. Cut all our hair off, and let's be the Magnificent Seven. Let's be a bunch of bald-headed guys, but let's have that camaraderie, that bond. We'll, we won't let our hair grow. We're gonna go out there and be a formidable foe. The defensive front received so much acclaim that the defensive backs would later dub themselves the Forgotten Four. As a testimonial to their effectiveness, the Seven Magnificents and Forgotten Four allowed only 66 points the entire season and recorded four shutouts. They finished as the nation's third-ranked rushing defense and fifth in total defense. The 64 season opened on a splendid note as Fred Bolitnikoff's nine catches for 165 yards and two TDs led FSU to a 14 to nothing shutout of the Miami Hurricanes. The Seminoles were off to a good start, but they would have to slay a bigger foe if they were to gain national respect. Kentucky brought that opportunity to Tallahassee for a homecoming affair. The Wildcats, undefeated and ranked fifth nationally after victories over Auburn and number one Old Miss, were no typical homecoming clown. But the tribe made them look like one. In a landmark victory for FSU, one labeled among the biggest upsets of all time according to the Dunkel Index, FSU blasted Kentucky 48 to 6. With the victory, FSU jumped to number 10 in the AP poll, their first ranking ever. On November 21st, 1964, the atmosphere was electric. The moment had finally arrived. The Gators came to Tallahassee for the first time ever. This game would never have taken place in Campbell Stadium without the dedication of Vaughn Mancha and Dean Mode Stone. We decided with Dean Moore, Dean Stone, and myself, we would go to games. We'll meet with our vice president and their athletic board chairman and Ray Graves to see if we can't work this dilemma out about a home and home. Dean Stone, after about an hour and a half or two hours of coffee drinking and arguing about across the table, Dean Moore reached over and said, Mr. Graves, how many seats will it take you to get you to get Tallahassee two years from now? <clears throat> Ray Rissa, well, <clears throat> well, Vaughn, I, I tell you, I think it'd take at least 40, 45,000 seats Dean Moore jumped up, put his hand across the table, said, all right, you got it. Motivation, as if the tribe needed any, was provided when the Gators practiced all week long in jerseys with the inscription, never FSU, never. On game day, UF swaggered onto the field with jerseys reading, go for seven, as in their seventh straight victory over the Seminoles. Big mistake. The game they went in there and they said, never, FSU, never, you'll never beat us. The little brother had grown up, and they knew it. Following a Florida State fumble, the Gators looked to capitalize early. But with their backs against the wall, the Seminole defense stood proud like so many times that season. Jack Schinholzer forced a fumble. George DeLisandro recovered to set the tone for the entire day. In the second half, Bolitnikov sailed past two Florida defenders and was wide open for a 55-yard TD reception. Untouched and undaunted, Fred jumped into the end zone for the score. Florida reserve quarterback Steve Spurrier would later try to salvage a comeback, but to no avail. FSU would win this one 16-7. Coupled with the earlier victory over Miami, the victory garnered Florida State its first state championship. We were expected to lose. 
You know, nobody expected us to beat them. And we went out there, and we were just physical with them. The win also helped FSU secure a major bowl bid in just the 18th year of the Seminole program. The Gator Bowl would be a matchup of striking contrasts. Oklahoma with its powerful running game against Florida State with its dazzling passing attack. The winningest team over the past 18 years versus the newest team to crash the national rankings. We went down there and all oh, the awesomeness of Oklahoma. They had everybody was an All-American at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. And here again, we, we might have been a little bit intimidated, but then again, we knew we were good. I don't think we even knew what, what tradition was, you know, and we played a lot of teams with a lot of, with a lot of tradition that year, including the Gator Bowl team, uh, Oklahoma, that, you know, it didn't make any difference to us. We didn't know. The Seminoles would kick tradition in the head while posting some memorable numbers. Tensey, 23 of 36, 303 yards and five touchdowns. Bolitnikov, 13 receptions, 191 yards and four touchdowns. Together, the dynamic duo set seven Gator Bowl records and were named co-MVPs of the contest. Offensively, Oklahoma had, not you know, being in that conference that they were in, they never played against a passing team. All of a sudden, they had to play against somebody that's throwing the ball 30 or 40 times a game. And they just were never ready for it, you know. And so we just went out there and just took the game to them, throwing. FSU crushed Oklahoma 36-19 in a game not as close as the score might indicate. FSU finished that 64 season with a 9-1-1 record, a number 10 national ranking, and 34 new school records. We we're just a bunch of guys that wanted to play football, love football. We came down here uh, involved in a program that was kind of a growing program. So we, all of a sudden, we pop up in collegiate football. We got a heck of a team, you know, and all of a sudden we're setting records. We're beating this team. We beat Florida. We're going to the Gator Bowl. We beat Oklahoma, that type of thing. And all of a sudden we, we get to be part of Florida State history. They thought they could beat anybody, you know, there was just no question about that. They, uh, they had confidence and they worked hard. FSU's fourth straight victory over Georgia highlighted the 1965 season, which also produced the school's first 100-yard touchdown play. T.K. Weatherall, who later became a key member of the Florida legislature, took a Bill Mormon lateral on a kickoff versus Kentucky and sprinted for a score that still stands in the FSU record book. In 1966, FSU went 6-5, with four losses to teams ranked in the AP poll. None would sting worse than the defeat to the Gators on a certain still controversial play. A six foot five junior wide receiver, Lane Fenner, will be remembered in Florida State lore for a catch that didn't count. In the 1966 clash with the Florida Gators, with UF leading 22 19 and only 28 seconds left, FSU faced second and 10 from the Gators 45. When star receiver Ron Sellers was shaken up, Fenner came in for his first play of the game. His first play of the season, in fact. On a post pattern which Fenner turned to the outside, quarterback Gary Padgett rolled right and heaved the ball into the end zone, where Fenner appeared to grab the game-winning touchdown. However, to the tribe's dismay, official Doug Mosley ruled that Fenner was out of bounds and the pass incomplete. So apparent was the TD that FSU passed pictures around following the game as proof of the catch. I can remember Lane catching the ball without a doubt, no question at all. And the ref was running down the sideline, signaling touchdown. And he got down there, and there were one or two Gator players that were signaling he was out of bounds. And by the time he had gotten there, he had changed his mind and said he was out of bounds. 1967 was similar to many previous ones at Florida State. The Seminoles' oldest and most persistent concern was depth. 
But two games against traditional power showed that depth was not always needed on a team stocked with heart and determination. Following the Tribe's season opening loss to the Houston Cougars, Alabama awaited in Birmingham, defending national champions and winners of 21 consecutive contests. Pete was trying to get us fired up, and uh, he made some comments to the fact that they were no different than we were. I mean, they had two arms, two legs. They put their pants on the same way we did, one leg at a time. Three touchdown underdogs were the Seminoles in a game that was to be televised as part of an ABC Sports documentary on legendary Alabama coach Bear Bryant. Fulfilling an impossible dream, FSU pulled off an amazing 37-37 tie to shock the football world. The 37 points were more than the Crimson Tide defense had given up the entire previous year. Kim Hammond and Sellers put on a, an exhibition of football that you had never seen before. That's one of the most interesting games that I've coached and was, uh, was surrounded by. The documentary would begin with a startled bear bellowing on the sidelines just after FSU's Walt Sumner returned to punt for a touchdown. What's going on out there? What the hell's going on out there? Bryant called FSU the best prepared team he had ever played. Ron Sellers led the Seminole offense with 13 receptions, and the Tribe, 0-1-1 following the contest, were ranked 18th the next week. Coach Bryant jokingly came up to me and says, are you Ron Sellers? I said, yes, sir. Yes, coach. And he said, well, this is the closest that one of my players have been to you in, uh, you know, in uh, the last six months because there was nobody who was within 10 yards of you all night that night. Before the Seminoles and Penn State met in the 1967 Gator Bowl, Nittany Lions coach Joe Paterno called Florida State the best passing team he had ever seen. Sheer flattery in the eyes of many, especially after Penn State raced to a 17-0 halftime lead. Kind of dismal, you know, for us. But uh, you know, we went in together, and the coaching staff said we can win this ball game. Coach Pete gave us one of his little talks at halftime and told us guys we just need to bear down and, and grit our teeth and go out there and play the ball that we were used to playing. Early in the second half, momentum began to shift on one single play. Still in front by 17. Penn State faced fourth and short from its own 15-yard line. Paterno made the surprising decision to go for it, and when his team failed to convert, the Tribe would gain momentum for the rest of the contest. Quarterback Kim Hammond hit Ron Sellers for the first Seminole TD, and a Nittany Lion fumble provided another chance soon after. The Tribe quickly cashed in and trailed now by only three points. With less than 30 seconds remaining and fourth and goal at the Penn State 8, FSU tied the game on a Mark Guthrie field goal. It was a remarkable comeback against a nationally known opponent and coach. The Seminoles finished 1967 ranked number four nationally by Sports Illustrated following a 7-2-2 campaign. While in certain areas FSU seemed short in talent, never did the Seminoles lack at quarterback during Peterson's time. The late 60s were no exception as three promising signal callers graced the campus. Bill Kappelman, Kim Hammond, and Gary Padgett took turns lighting up the Seminole skyline, with most of their tosses going to celebrated wide receiver Ron Sellers. Ron Sellers was the most prolific receiver in Florida State history and among the most productive in NCAA annals. In fact, Jingle Joints held most of the national receiving records from the end of his senior season in 1968 until 1987. They said I was kind of elusive a little bit, but I was bow-legged as they come. And matter of fact, Floyd Little 
is probably the only guy, football player, has has bow legs worse than mine. So he just said, I could walk over a fire hydrant uh, without having to jump over it. And uh, so then, because I was so skinny, and uh, they just started calling me jingle joints. From 1966 to 1968, Sellers accumulated 3,598 yards and 23 scores on 212 receptions. He caught passes in 30 straight games, averaging 119.9 yards per game. A member of the College Football Hall of Fame, Sellers' graceful stride and sure hands made him one of the game's all-time greats. I ran uh, inaccurate routes, but I could catch a football, and after I caught it, um, I was pretty good at running with the ball uh, after I caught the ball. Sellers, I think, is one of the great receivers of all time. I, uh, the guy would go across the middle. He had great speed. He was a great kid to coach, a great attitude, you know. And uh, so he was a great, great kid. When Bill Peterson arrived at FSU, Seminole football was floundering. He left the school with one of the most heralded offensive machines of the decade and legends and lore of plenty. Jingle Joints, Bolitnikoff, the Seven Magnificents, the Alabama Tie, and so much more. His slips of the tongue may have captured the public's fancy, but Peterson's legacy was far more significant. He was as instrumental in putting FSU on the college football map as any other person. The post-Peterson era began on a bright note and was highlighted by the individual performances of several Seminole stalwarts. Quarterback Gary Hoff checked in at number one nationally in three different categories during the 1971 season. He compiled over 2,700 plus passing yards and 23 touchdown tosses. Barry Smith would literally rewrite the Seminole receiving records. His 25 career touchdown catches still top the FSU charts. Smith was considered by many the nation's most dangerous receiver in 1972, and his pure, raw speed made him different from previous Seminole greats Bolitnikoff and Sellers. In 1971, the tribe would inaugurate a second Southwestern Bowl game as they traveled to Tempe, Arizona for the first ever Fiesta Bowl. Arizona State ranked fifth nationally, and 10-1 and one on the season would be the opponent. In one of the most exciting games in postseason history, the Seminoles and Sun Devils exchanged scoring punches throughout. While FSU lost the game, Huff was named most valuable player, following a 25 of 46 performance for 347 yards and two touchdowns. The ten years of coaches Larry Jones and Daryl Mudra were valuable learning experiences in the overall growth of Florida State football. Neither coach, however, was able to sustain the success of the Peterson era. So, in 1976, FSU turned to a former Peterson assistant to return the Seminoles to glory, Bobby Bowden. Prior to Bowden's arrival, FSU President Stanley Marshall and Athletic Director Clay Stapleton were making what they considered a bold effort to crack into big-time college football. Their wisdom dictated that the Seminoles should schedule bigger games versus bigger teams at their home sites in order to gain more national exposure. They were number three in the nation, I believe, and we'd go out there to play them. We just lost the week before. And so we were gonna get we were gonna get clobbered that day. Flat pitch back up to Flat. Little hole, Flat goes score! Touchdown, Florida State! I don't ever remember feeling that they were gonna score on us, feeling that the game was at hand and they were they were fixing to beat us. I never at once can remember feeling 
that we were going to lose that football game. And Roger Quake, he's going to roll toward his right side. Borowski, Borowski's going to tap him. He loses the football. The Seminoles are going to fall on it. Florida State's come up with it. They own the football in the ball game. Right. Seminoles recover the twin fumble. Borowski. I always felt like you know, that was our greatest win away from home. At that, no, no, back in those days, nobody beat Nebraska there, even Oklahoma. That Pitt team had Marino at quarterback, had Hugh Green, who was Defensive Player of the Year in the nation, at defensive end, had 17 boys that went into professional football. I couldn't believe it. And we played them here and beat them right after the Nebraska win. And uh, I still think that's the best football team we ever beat since I've been here. And I also think that, that back, those two wins back to back are the best, biggest two wins we ever had here. To beat those two schools, both ranked number three in the country, uh, were, were just something that I'll remember forever. And, and uh, I think it did a lot for Florida State University in giving not only the football and athletic programs at Florida State, but the entire school there a lot of confidence and a lot of pride to, that they were part of Florida State University. Ohio State, we beat, played them in 1981 and 82 there. Another one of those deals where no return game. You've got to come up here and let us beat you. But uh, we go up here and beat them. And those are two big wins. I, was, I think Ohio State played in the Rose Bowl maybe both years. You know, but we beat them up there, and that was, that'll was always be a big win to us. I, I still run a lot of Ohio people that, that were there that day that couldn't believe we beat them. Anybody who studies the history of college football and the success of college football from the very beginning, I think it all goes right back to Notre Dame, who is still the number one prestigious university in college football in the nation, you know. And so for us to go there in 1981 and play them, where all those great Notre Dame players had come from, and me as a coach could remember the history of it, my coaches could remember it, and to go in that dressing room where Newt Rotten used to be, you know, and, and things like that, knowing all the great teams that had played there. And then for, then on top of that, not only did you get to play them there, but you beat them in their own backyard. When I came to Florida State, looked at our schedule, we had LSU five years in a row every one of them in Baton Rouge. Now back in those days, Baton Rouge was known as Delft Valley. You didn't beat Bat LSU back in those days there. You just look at their record before 1982 or three. They, they didn't lose games there, you know? And uh, they had national championship teams that going and couldn't beat them there. And so it was kind of a suicide type of thing. We, it was a game that was scheduled before I got here to raise money because we were losing a lot of money. And so, but now the thing about it, we'd go in there and beat them four out of five. And had to play them there again next year and beat them another time. We beat them five out of six. So that really helped put us on the map. And for some reason, we had their number. You know, you know how Miami's always had our number? You know, we always had LSU's number. Coach Bowden has become many things to many people. He has been quoted, paraphrased, and quoted again. Indeed, Bowden is a true Southern gentleman in every sense of the phrase. Folksy, polite, and quite often downright hysterical. Perhaps these attributes are best revealed through his own speech. Hey, give me 21 points now, kick him. Let's give him, take 21 points out of there. Then he only got 50, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're doing better than you think. There was, no, there was another reception I was in. This time everybody was dressed. There was a lady sitting next to me, a Polish lady. And uh, she was pregnant. I asked her, I said, you're pregnant, aren't you? She said, yeah, but it ain't mine. Because <laughs> we're Seminoles of FSU. Yes, we're Seminoles. And we want you. Only experience, that we do not have. But it'll come. You just have to be patient. You have to be patient. I'm going to be. I got a lifetime job. <laughs> You know what we got coming up now? We got Miami. They won today. They're going to come in here about fourth in the nation. Or fifth. They're going to come here fourth or fifth in the nation. Well, 
Let's pray. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking we, we are not going to win a national championship. We, it's not, I'll never win one. It's, it is, it's not, it's just not for me, you know. But the guy, the guy, the guy misses it, and I find this out. Wide left is better than wide right. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to present from us uh, a number one for our president, and uh, you might want to jog in this if you can get down I'll south. Do <laughs> if the snow ever stops here, I will. Thank you. While Bowden's personality draws attention to his team and his players, nothing can fire up a crowd more than a strong, proud mascot. And Florida State has one of the best. One of the most symbolic and significant traditions at FSU, Chief Osceola and Renegade made their first appearance September 16, 1978, when FSU faced Oklahoma State. Today, Chief Osceola, a Florida State student, dresses in a traditional costume made and donated by the Seminole Indian tribe of Florida. Hoisting a flaming spear atop the spirited Appaloosa Bay horse called Renegade, Chief Osceola leads the tribe onto the field before every home game. Then, Renegade gallops to midfield, carried by the roars of the Seminole faithful rises on his hind legs, and Chief Osceola drives the spear into the Campbell Stadium turf. Seminole fans like to say that when the flaming spear drops, the opponent's luck stops. Throughout Bobby Bowden's tenure as head coach of the Florida State Seminoles, there have been numerous memorable plays and games. Many of Bowden's unforgettable moments involve something a little different. Whether a trick play or just plain luck, often it seemed that someone up above was always on Bowden's side. Bowden first delved into his amazing playbook in his first season as FSU head coach, 1976. In one three-game stretch, the Seminoles converted four scoring plays of over 90 yards, a feat so rare that the NCAA doesn't even keep statistics on such occurrences. Those plays announced loudly and clearly that Bobby Bowden had begun to make his mark on FSU football. We had four 90-yard touchdown passes, plays, in the last three games of the season. Now, you, you say, well, so what? Well, I'll tell you what, so what? I don't think we've had one since. Oh, we might have had one. You know, we might have had one. His wide open gambling style makes Bowden's teams a treat to watch and a pleasure to play on. Reverses, flea flickers, laterals, you name it, here it comes. And many times, he simply reaches into that bag of tricks at just the right time. Clemson's got 10 at the line of scrimmage. They're coming after it with a minute 33 to go in the game. It's 21-21. And here's the short handoff and the little handoff to the upback. Leroy Butler's got a long way to go to the 40. Leroy Butler to the 50. Leroy Butler to the 40 to the 30. Leroy Butler to the 20. Leroy to the 10. Leroy Butler knocked out of bounds at the four-yard line. What a play by the Seminoles. Some razzle-dazzle. A minute 20 to go, and the Seminoles have it first and goal on the Clemson. We saved it for the right time. We called it at the right time. It, it was like drawing to an inside straight. You had to get the right card. It wouldn't work. In other words, they wanted an exact defense you wanted them in. It wasn't going to work, and they were in it. He won't get it. It's going to go into the end zone, and it's going to be run out. Eric Thomas has come try to run it out and throw it back across the field. Look it over there by Hester. Jesse Hester now up the sideline. Motion the tight end, Pat Carter, and the toss sweep and the reverse. It goes to Dossie on the reverse. First play from scrimmage. Dossie to the 35 to the 40. Oh, Dossie no. to the 50 yard line. Oh, Dossie no. to the 45 yard line of Michigan State. Then it goes in motion to the left side. Here's Weldon looking. Throws the ball. It is a lateral to Charlie Ward. Trick play right back across the field to Weldon. Weldon's got the ball. He'll run. Oh, Weldon to the 30 yard line. Weldon to the 20 yard line. Weldon to the 15. Weldon to the 11. Bubbles the football. Diving on an FSU. 
Barbecue and the Seminoles have the football. He is two for two in field goals. A big one here. Good snap. Here's good. Oh, the pitch goes to the fullback. And the Seminoles have a touchdown. Out of Bradley Hill play. Brad Johnson laterals it forward. And the Seminoles score a touchdown. Traffic is good out. Swings it out to Warwick Dunn. Wants to throw the pass downfield. He's got Omar Ellison out there. He makes the catch to the 40. He's the 30. Nice up to the 20. To the 15 to the 10. 5. 3. Touchdown. Florida State. Omar Ellison. Halfback pass. Warwick Dunn. There are old sages of the game who say that the true measure of a college football coach is how well he fares in bowl games. By that measuring stick, Bobby Bowden has simply no peers. He's the winningest bowl coach in NCAA history by a mile. Bowden Seminoles have won an NCAA record 11 consecutive bowls and have gone to 14 straight bowls without tasting defeat. FSU has appeared in 25 bowls in just 49 years of playing football. Motivating and challenging his troops to do their best is another Bowden specialty. And three of his players, exemplary in their talent and dedication, have had their uniforms retired. Perhaps the greatest defender in Florida State history, Ron Simmons, number 50, was retired in 1988. In 1977, Simmons' first season as Florida State's starting nose guard, he turned a defense that was amongst the worst in college football the year before into one of the top 10 in the country. Out of 106 teams in 1A, we were probably about 105 defensively. You couldn't stop anybody. That next year, we had eight of those guys back. We got Ronnie Simmons out of high school, put him at nose guard, started him as a freshman. And with those other eight guys back that, that, that were the worst in the country, they became about the top 10, 11th in the nation. A big jump. I always felt like he's the guy that cemented that thing together. Simmons also helped FSU reach a pair of Orange Bowls following the 1979 and 1980 seasons a dominating lineman, and the tribe's first two-time consensus All-American. Simmons lived in the opponent's backfield. He totaled 25 career quarterback sacks and 44 tackles for loss, both Seminole records. Simmons' sheer speed and strength made him all but unblockable, and his impact on the turnaround of FSU football cannot be overstated. One of the most honored yet humble athletes in the history of college football, Charlie Ward quarterbacked the Seminoles to the 1993 National Championship and set 19 school and seven ACC records along the way. A consensus All-American, Ward won over 30 individual honors, including Florida State's first Heisman Trophy. I was just very excited uh, about the opportunity that I had to be in that position um, to win a Heisman Trophy and you know God has blessed me, blessed me with a great team, great players around me and you know it happened. Second and goal from the two, here's the snap, Charlie runs to his right, Charlie has been here the angle, five, three, two, one, touchdown, Charlie Ward, touchdown, Charlie Ward. In his two year stint as the Seminole starter, he became FSU's all time total yardage leader, had the highest completion rate for a career and set the record for TD passes in a season. He did it all in a calm, collected manner, which belied the havoc Ward invariably wreaked on opponents. When he graduated from Florida State, he gave me a football and he, as a, with his signature, and he, and he had a note on there, thank you for giving me the opportunity of playing for you. Well, I couldn't believe that. I'm not, 
I would have written thank you for having given me the opportunity of coaching you, you know. But here he was, uh, helped led us to a national championship and one of the best football teams we've ever had, one of the best two years back to back that he started we ever had, and here he is thanking me, us, for the opportunity of letting him play. You know, he's, he's that, that tells you a lot about Charlie. Cornerback Deion Sanders was one of the finest athletes ever to wear a Seminole uniform, winning the Jim Thorpe Award as America's top defensive back in 1988. Beginning in 1985, Sanders gathered 14 interceptions, not including three crucial pickoffs in bowl games. In both his junior and senior seasons, FSU went 11-1 with a pair of New Year's Day bull wins. One of the best athletes we've ever had at Florida State, maybe the best, probably the fastest, great track athlete, great baseball player, great uh, uh, football player, and, and if he says, it, it, the old saying, it, it, it ain't bragging if you can do it, it's Dion. During the 1988 season, Sanders also electrified as the nation's top punt returner averaging 15.2 yards per attempt. Backpedaling is Sanders, he will field it at 25. Looks for somewhere to come. Comes right up the middle, makes a nice cut. Deion Sanders to the 50, Deion Sanders to the 40. Deion Sanders hurdles to the 30, to the 20. Deion Sanders will score a Seminole touchdown. By the sky, what a run. His 76-yard TD versus Clemson sparked the Knowles to victory. While Sanders flamboyant style captured the public spotlight, it is his work ethic and unique talent that coaches and teammates will remember most. While Bowden's early years saw the Seminoles attain new national prominence, the years 1987 through 95 were filled with unprecedented accomplishments. Actually, the groundwork for the success of 87 and beyond was laid in February of 1985 when a recruiting class that included the likes of Dion Sanders, Sammy Smith, Pat Tomberlin, and Odell Hagen signed on to become Seminoles. That group became the core of the 1987, 88, and 89 teams that would combine for 32 victories, including a pair of Fiesta Bowl titles and three wins over Florida. Needless to say, the Seminoles have not looked back since. In the nine years beginning with 1987, FSU has won 10 or more games and finished in the top four of the polls each and every season. No school in NCAA history can match either feat. Florida State's 96-13-1 record is the nation's second best in that time. The Seminoles have won every bowl game in that nine-year span, including eight New Year's Day affairs, plus the inaugural Blockbuster Bowl against Penn State in 1990. From the 19, blitz coming, Ferguson on the bootleg, rolls toward his right, fires the pass, it is caught by Dawson at the 15, Dawson to the 10, Dawson to the 5, to the 3, to the 1, he's in for the touchdown! FSU sports a 7-2-1 record over the arch-rival Gators in the past nine years, including a lopsided 52-17 win in 1988 and a scintillating 33-21 triumph in 1993 that ultimately propelled the Seminoles to the national title. But Florida isn't the only Southeastern Conference foe the Knowles have dominated. FSU carried a 13-3-1 record against SEC competition since 1987. In 1990, Florida State declined an invitation to join a league that had for years spurned the Seminoles, instead joining the Atlantic Coast Conference. From 1992 to 95, the Knowles won their first 29 meetings with ACC foes the third best conference win streak in NCAA history and have claimed four ACC crowns in as many years. 
Florida State's reputation as an offensive juggernaut is well deserved. Bowden's teams have routinely racked up over 500 yards and 50 points in single games, thanks to an imaginative mix of passing finesse and rushing muscle. Passers like Danny McManus, Peter Tom Willis, Casey Weldon, Charlie Ward, and Danny Cannell have all shattered record after record with pinpoint accuracy and nerve to spare. Long noted for its great receiving tradition, Florida State has continued to turn out top-notch wideouts like Ronald Lewis, Lawrence Dossey, Kez McCorvey, Tamarek Vanover, and Andre Cooper. Great running backs have been another Seminole standby from Sammy Smith to Dexter Carter to Amp Lee to Warwick Dunn. Sleek and slippery, these runners have showcased FSU's multifaceted attack. As explosive as Bowden's offenses have been, the coach himself will tell you that defense wins championships and Seminole defenders have helped prove that model over the past nine years. Deion Sanders' suffocating coverage began a tradition that has earned FSU the nickname Cornerback U. Players like Leroy Butler, Terrell Buckley, and Clifton Abraham kept the legacy alive under the tutelage of coach Mickey Andrews. Linebacker Paul McGowan became Florida State's first recipient of the Butkus Award in 1992, an honor claimed by the Austin Marvin Jones five years later. FSU's linebacking lineage boasts the likes of Kurt Carruthers and Derek Brooks, who hungrily hunted down opposing ball carriers. Not to be outdone, the Seminole defensive line has provided the building blocks for many a great defense. Odell Hagens and Eric Hayes made a formidable duo in the late 80s, followed by Carl Simpson, Derek Alexander, and a host of other rugged D-liners. It's no wonder that since 1987, Seminole players have been the most decorated in the country when it comes to national awards. Heisman, Maxwell, Lombardi, Butkus, Thorpe, Unitas. Nebraska may hold the nation's winningest record since 1987, but the Cornhuskers have had no luck against FSU. The Knowles have won all four meetings with Nebraska over that span including a hard-fought 1816 triumph in the 1994 Orange Bowl for the national title. But the Huskers shouldn't feel bad. The Knowles have whipped most comers over the past nine years. Unforgettable victories have included a 51-31 win at Michigan in 1991, in which the Seminoles scored more points than any foe ever in Ann Arbor. It was on national television. It was on Armed Forces Network. I mean, we were, well, you talk about on this play, Florida State and Michigan were on this play. Plus, the stadium has 105,000 seats, and it was filled, you know? So, man, what a display. And then what we do, we go out there and put on one of the best offensive shows we have ever put on at Florida State. The 1992 rally at Georgia Tech, where Charlie Ward and company unleashed the fast break offense en route to a 29-24 comeback victory. And speaking of comebacks, who can forget Florida State's 31-31 tie against Florida in 94? in which the Danny Cannell-led Knowles staged the greatest fourth quarter turnaround in NCAA history. Good stretch. 
Here's the snap. Hand off to Preston. Preston, three, two, one. Touchdown. 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 Can you believe it? By 1993, no one disputed Florida State's place among college football's elite. Still, there was one thing missing from the Seminoles' resume, a national championship. That was soon to change. That Seminole team made it clear early on that they were something special. An incredible 12-play goal line stand against Kansas in the season opening kickoff classic showed the nation that Florida State had the grit and guts to carry its number one preseason ranking till the end. I think we went out there against Kansas and showed that, you know, we want to carry the team. And, you know, defense, we're going to win the championship, you know, at this university. And I think that goal line stand really kind of set our foundation for us for something to build on throughout the year. The accomplishments of 1993 were numerous. Heisman Trophy winner Charlie Ward was one of four All-Americans and 17 All-ACC selections on the squad. FSU rolled over its conference competition by an average of 42.5 points and collected four shutouts on the year. FSU claimed the state championship, which some feel is tougher to win than a national title by beating Miami and Florida. Most telling, the Seminoles led the nation in both scoring offense and scoring defense. There would be one bump along the road to a title, however. In a classic confrontation, the top-ranked Seminoles traveled to South Bend, Indiana, to take on the second-ranked Notre Dame Fighting Irish. A matchup rightly billed as the game of the century, and it would all come down to one final play. For once, Charlie Ward could not work his magic, and the Irish prevailed, 31-24. A week later, however, fortune smiled on FSU as Notre Dame lost 41-39 to Boston College. Rejuvenated by the news of Notre Dame's demise, the Seminoles crushed North Carolina State 62-3 to reclaim the top spot in the Associated Press Bowl. But there was one team that stood between Florida State and a New Year's date with destiny. The Florida Gators. The Seminoles dominated their rivals for three quarters, yet they led by only 26-21 with 5.58 remaining. Facing a critical third down from the FSU 21-yard line, Ward softly lobbed a pass through the Florida field uproar and found freshman Warwick Dunn on the other end. 79 yards later, Dunn was in the end zone, and the Knolls were on their way to Miami's Orange Bowl. We're here to get that win, Arthur. That's the thing we've worked for right now to now. You know? I mean, you don't want to hold nothing back. You know, you ain't gonna hold nothing back, man. Most observers, frankly, expected Florida State to beat Nebraska handily despite the Cornhuskers' undefeated record and number two AP ranking. But a proud Nebraska squad came ready to fight. Luckily, so did the Seminoles. Nebraska took a 7-6 halftime lead, but a William Floyd touchdown plunge gave FSU a 12-7 edge, which Scott Bentley stretched to 15-7 with a 39-yard field goal. Nebraska stormed back, though, taking a 16-15 lead with just 1-16 remaining. Undaunted, as always, Ward led the Seminoles down the field, quickly gaining the Cornhusker five-yard line. From there, Bentley drove a 22-yard field goal straight through the uprights for an 18-16 Seminole advantage. The Tribe had still to withstand a 45-yard field goal try by Nebraska's Byron Bennett on the game's final play. 
The kick sailed left, and Bobby Bowden and Florida State had their first national title, a mere 47 years after the program's inception. I'm very happy and excited that I was a part of the first national championship team. For the mere fact that they've had so many great teams and uh, it was just a matter of uh, being on the right team at the right time. It was a great year. It was a great ball club. And uh, yet I, I think we had some ball clubs just about as good that didn't win it, but only lost it by one point. But uh, this team deserved to win it, and they, and they, and they did. Through all the excitement of the Knowles' nine-year stay atop the poles, one thing has remained constant, Bobby Bowden. Like the finer things in life, Bowden has simply gotten better with age. And like the Florida State program itself, he's shown a willingness to not just adapt to the times, but to set the trends himself, to battle the heavyweights anywhere, anytime, and to whip them then and there, to lay a solid foundation and then reap the benefits down the road. Bobby Bowden is one of just two active coaches to claim over 250 career victories, and the almost unheard of plateau of 300 wins may well be within his reach. Who knows, Bowden may even surpass his idol, Alabama's Bear Bryant, one day. It may seem, having accomplished so much in such a short span, that Florida State football is a story of overnight success. While it's true that the Seminoles' ascent to the top of college football has been remarkably swift, there were plenty of dues paid along the way. Longtime Seminole fans must look back in amazement at where the program started and where it is today. From the hard scrabble turf of Centennial Field to today's magnificent Doak Campbell Stadium. From Don Veller's cockeyed T formation to today's fast break shotgun set. From the so-called UF rejects to today's national award winners. Different eras, yes, but tied together by commitment, pride, and what Bobby Bowden likes to call audacity bold courage and daring in the face of long odds. It is that quality, audacity, that first gave rise to the Florida State program, then sparked the tribe to victory against established opponents, and has driven latter-day Seminole teams to unprecedented heights. A remarkable half-century of Florida State football is in the books, and if history is any indication, the next 50 years will be just as garnet and golden. <laughs>